Mike, thanks for coming back on the pod, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be back on. So you've been on a number of times now, and I really like your systematic way of approaching a number of subjects. So I'm super curious to know, do you have a general framework or system of thinking when you're approaching new things or topics? So for example, when I'm thinking about where to start with a subject in regards to human behavior, I would tend to start by using an evolutionary psychology lens to start and then work forward from there. But I'm curious, how do you approach thinking through issues from like a 30,000 foot view? Do you have a specific way in which you go about that? For sure. So I think the number one place you want to start looking at issues, a lot of times issues are brought to us because they are contentious, because they're debated, because people don't agree on them entirely. Global warming is a really good example. Uh, you know, there's a lot of real fiery people on all sorts of sides of the issue. To me, a real good place to start is science basics or structure basics, not directly related to the issue. So if I had to figure out how to fix a light and make the light work, and I had to open up the lamp and look at circuit, circuits and stuff, I wouldn't Google like how lamps work, not at all, because I don't know anything about electricity. I would start reading the basics of electricity first, and just familiarize myself with like the fuck electrons are and how that shit all works, what's a circuit, so on and so forth. Then I would move on to slightly more uh, advanced like circuit design. Okay, like what is a closed circuit, open circuit, what... How do you, you know, what's interference and all that other stuff, resistance, yada, yada, yada. And then once I was pretty confident I had a decent grasp of the fundamentals, I would start to read a manual on how to fix a lamp. But then once you read that manual, you're like, oh, I, this makes total sense. Of course, the, the circuit hasn't been closed. You just got to close the circuit and it'll work. But if you don't know what close the circuit means, you don't know what the fuck electricity does or how it works gee, you're just down to just following verbatim instructions. And if something doesn't work, you have no idea how to troubleshoot it because you don't know any of the basics. So a lot of folks, you know, will have uh, complex thoughts on global warming, but you ask them like, you know, oh, well, how much do you know about climate? Like the science? And they're like, well, nothing. I like, I got you. What the fuck are you, why are you talking about global warming? And then a lot of people on the sort of, that, that's usually on the right wing side are people like global warming is fake. I'm like, how, how do you know that? And they're like, well, I, I, I'd like it to be fake. Like, well, same here. <laughs> it's probably real. And then you talk to people on the other side, the, like ecology psychos, and they're like, we need to change the economy to, to restructure society because global warming is so bad. And you can ask them, so how much do you know about economics? And they'd be like, well, I, I don't because it's a bullshit profession. It's fraught with just bias. And you're like, I, I got you. So you're going to regrow an economy without knowing any basic principles of economics. Uh, don't you think you can get in trouble there? And sometimes on their best days, they'd be like, well, yeah, like, sure, we should have economists. We should listen to them. And you listen to the economists, and they're like, oh, actually, there's all kinds of crazy trade-offs here. And though global warming is real, we have to estimate its total cost to the planet. And then whatever we do to fix it or work around it can't be more than that total cost because that's literally backwards, right? Like we're literally just throwing away money. We could be doing it help global poverty, purify water supplies, go to outer space, make people happier, whatever the hell else money's good for, and it's good for pretty much everything. So starting from a fundamental understanding of the rules of the game is critical to my thinking. Now, other steps follow later, but that is absolutely essential. Otherwise, you're swimming in a real deep ocean, and, and you don't really know how to swim, uh, you know, because you don't, you're not prepared for fundamentals. Probably the reason that I wrote Scientific Principles of Strength Training with my colleagues and Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training books is because there was no one place where the fundamentals were described. I had to write it because I was tired of just like disorganized thoughts. So now when I wrote the books, other people can read them. So if they really want to know about hypertrophy, they read these books and they're like, oh, well, that makes sense. I know a system of rules and I can now apply them to a high degree because I know that system. So before you know an underlying system, I wouldn't reason about it much. People ask me a ton uh, every now and again, or a ton, uh, just in random conversation, like what I think about various stock market movements. Oh, stock, stock market's up, that's good, right? I'm like, I have no fucking clue anything about the stock market. And I've charitably done enough reading on basic economics and some advanced economics to probably fill an undergraduate or master's degree worth of work. 
I still don't know about the market because I never looked into it specifically and I don't really know the rules of the market all that well. I just don't even bother speculating in it because I fucking have no idea what's going on. But plenty of people, my, my intelligence, a higher intelligence and often a fraction of my intelligence, have, have no problem speculating about the market and those are the people who get burned on shit like Bitcoin or whatever, or falls through the floor. They never knew why it was going up. They don't know why it's going down. And they're like, oh shit, this is really bad. Happens in the fitness industry all the time. People don't know the fundamentals. They try to solve problems. In order to be a good problem solver, you have to try to understand the fundamental rules that create and guide the system. Once you can do that, you can do a lot of problems. 50% of all your problems are solved already. And then there are the more difficult problems that require more advanced thinking skills. So when someone comes to you with a really specific question about training volume, and it's just so specific where it's like, should I do six sets of biceps this week or 10 sets of biceps or whatever, and not understanding the big picture of zooming out total volume over the course of a, you know weeks, months, years, whatever, do you just guide them towards educating themselves around the basics first and foremost, and then tell them to work forward from there? Yeah, it's just, uh, that's a really good question. It often d depends on how they couch their own question. A lot of times they'll give me a, a profoundly complicated plan bereft of any kind of theoretical base. And they'll say, is what I'm doing okay? And I just scan it quickly and go, yeah, it looks fine. And they say, well, can it be better? And I go, oh yeah, <laughs> sure. And they're like, how? I'm like, well, I could tell you one way it would be better, but I don't want you to idolize that way, reify it. And all of a sudden, like, that's the better way and everything else sucks because there's lots of other ways and there's lots of other even better ways. So then when they ask like, okay, what's the better way? I'm like, well, you know, uh, here's this book about the basic principles. Because if you're looking, if you already have an advanced plan written and you're looking for better ways, which is to say you're looking for uh, the road to optimality, I assume you have the bandwidth to consume quite a bit more insight. You know, it, it's very unusual for people to write something very wildly complicated. You can imagine someone made like an unbelievable circuit just as a hobby. They made this super, super complicated circuit at home with just basic nodes and, and electrodes and stuff. And you're like, and they're like, how can I make this better? You happen to be an electrician or an electrical engineer. And you're like, um, well, here's this textbook on electrical engineering. And they're like, no, fuck that. You know, <laughs> like it's, if they went that far, they're probably like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> so a lot of times I'll refer people to the basics. They'll come back many times, um, six months, 12 months later and go, oh my God, like I can write my own plans. I know the matrix. And I'm like, sweet. And now your old question looks kind of kind of uh, silly. And they're like, oh man, I can't even believe I asked you that. And I'm like, look, I've asked so many stupid questions that could fill an entire, you know, sphere the size of the earth. But that, that's the thing is you can give answers. Like, no, I think this is fine because sometimes that's all people are looking for. I don't want to be the dick that anyone asks me any question. I'm like, well, you really should do is get an education of the basics. Like, dude, fuck that. I asked you a fucking simple question. Like, can you imagine being like, you pull over, like you're driving through Canada and you pull over and you ask a cop, like, which, which way is the... The store, he's like, well, you know, what you should do is understand the topography of our city much better. You're like, what the <laughs> fuck? Where the fuck is the store? God damn it. I'm not here to understand shit. That's totally fine. Now, the cop is actually paid by your tax dollars to be a representative. I'm not paid on Instagram to answer anyone's questions. Uh, so I can just tell them, like, here's my book. Go fuck off. But uh, it's better for encouraging them to think, uh, to give them, like, you know, you give them some valuable insight. Like, I think this is good, but maybe raise your volume or maybe lower your volume a little bit. And then the next question is one I get the complexity. When they go, so what do you mean by raising lower volume? I'm like, ah, it's a good question. Volume landmarks video, it's 35 minutes long. And they're like, ah, damn it. Look, I could explain this to you and it would make no sense. Or I could teach you how to fish, so to speak. And then you'll be answering questions like this for a long time. And you, but the good thing is it's an auto test. Uh, if someone asks you a secondary question that literally demonstrates their willingness to spend time and value on the issue, which means ostensibly they would also be okay with watching a video or reading a snippet out of a book. You know what I mean? It would be very odd for someone to do 10 follow-up questions over the course of 30 minutes on Instagram. And then you're like, try reading this book. And they're like, nah, fuck that. I don't have time for that. Like you could have read this book now. <laughs> so it, it is one of those things that, that lends itself well to kind of an auto-regulated approach, so to speak. Okay. So when you guide someone towards a resource and they start to educate themselves on it a little bit, and something called, I've fallen for this a million and one times, but the Dunning-Kruger effect. So you learn a little bit about something and then you think you know a lot and then you come to learn that you know you knew shit all at the beginning. Um, and then eventually kind of you come out the back end, it's like a U-shaped curve sort of deal. And maybe you become an expert on the back end of that. How do you recommend that folks sort of avoid 
coming across like a sort of like a dick and then B when they learn something new and, and spouting it off and then B just super uninformed. Yeah. So the good thing is, is if you attack issues from, from the perspective of foundational elements, you're less likely to demonstrate Dunning Kruger because you're actually learning the true core of the issues. So you actually like, you know, uh, if you learn in your first week of economics class that supply and demand are incredibly powerful forces that fundamentally guide a ton of economic activity, if you go and someone's on Facebook saying supply and demand is bullshit, like fairness for all or some crazy shit, <laughs> and you say, well, I think supply and demand are very important and they guide a lot of our economic decision-making and the resultant economies that form, you know, a Nobel Prize laureate in economics isn't going to come in and Dunning-Kruger your ass. He's not going to be like, fucking idiot. He's going to be like, that, that's true. <laughs> now, this specific issue may be an issue in which supply and demand have failed to produce the results that we would like as a society. It, it's certainly more nuanced than, uh, you, it's, again, how you say it. If you say supply and demand are uh, the core, very important elements of much of the economy, that's a completely true statement. But if you say, like, supply and it's all about supply and demand, it's not all about supply and demand. Sometimes it doesn't work out. It's a minority of the times, but sometimes it, it doesn't actually work out that way. So one of the big recommendations for how to avoid Dunning Kruger is do not make absolutist statements when you haven't scanned essentially the vast majority or all of the data. Like, are you really sure that everything is supply and demand? Well, sure as hell, you didn't learn that in economics. They never said everything. They said the are powerful, important forces that should be considered. If you say that, no one's ever going to Dunning Kruger you because everyone who is an expert agrees with you expertise is very good at saying as much as it understands and no more. One of the biggest things about Dunning-Kruger isn't actually, of course, it's actually knowing more stuff, but it's a, a lot of it is an emotional thing. You, an expert may not know a ton more than you if you've read a bunch of articles. He just doesn't have the bravado that you do because he's fucked himself up with it before and it's fucking embarrassing to be wrong. So instead of saying, you know, high reps build muscle just as well as low reps, because, you know, people say that, you say, you know, it seems that the difference between high rep and low rep training for muscle growth is so small that most studies can't detect it, which may mean that over the long term, one of the rep ranges is better. And maybe for some individuals, it's better to go lower high rep, but it's certainly not the super important thing. I mean, that's a true statement, but notice how significantly more couched that statement was in probabilities. Um, that's something you get as an expert is understanding that there's nuance to things. Don't make absolute statements. That's like stuff you could know before you learn anything. And then you can look like an expert that's just quiet a lot. <laughs> uh, and the experts can speak up. So like, if you ask someone, you got Greg Knuckles, true expert sitting in one chair, and you got guy who read uh, several articles, but knows how not to make a fool of himself. 10 questions, Greg may be able to answer nine of them expert style. That guy may be able to answer one. But what's done in Kruger is when that guy thinks he can answer all 10, right? And he starts blabbing and not, not knowing what he's talking about. So as you learn, know what you know, and don't pretend you know any more than that. Take relativistic, conditional statements at face value. Don't try to expand them into absolute statements. Uh, that's really the, the trick with Dunning-Kruger because people say like, you know, I don't want to embarrass myself. Embarrassing yourself is almost always and everywhere voluntary. Like when someone asks a question, you can always just shut the fuck up. And you can always just say, I don't know. Experts have to say that less because they know more shit, but they're also really good because they're confident about what they know. They don't have an ego problem with feeling they don't know anything. So for example, people will ask me stuff about like autophagy and health. Like, is it really true that sort of programmed cell death is a real big deal? I don't fucking know. I don't know. Why am I okay saying I don't know? Because I've already, life has taught me I'm really fucking smart. I'm super fucking successful. I don't fucking need to know everything for the love of fucking God. You're like, uh, can you beat up Elon Musk in a fight? Like, yeah, almost certainly. Do you think he cares? Like, oh no, I lost a fight. Like my value as a man is gone. Like you fucking kidding me? He's basically like a multi, whatever, hundred billionaire. He gives a flying fuck. He'd be like, yeah, I'm weak. I'm pathetic. Fine. I'm going to buy your house, burn it as a joke, kick your family out. And you're like, ah, oh, shit, I guess you are the man. Right? So I think expertise brings it with a level of confidence. But you no longer feel like you need to make shit up or expand your boundaries beyond your comfort zone to try to say anything. And, you know, we've all met that guy in the gym that's been lifting for six months and watched, uh, saw a couple of articles from Testosterone Nation. And he's next to a girl and he's like, yeah, man, you got to fucking squat past parallel or it doesn't fucking grow your legs. And you're like, there is a grain of truth in what you're saying, but you put it so terribly and everyone who knows anything knows you're dumb. His option wasn't, 
not just in case he just didn't know enough to not Dunning Kruger himself, he could have just shut the fuck up or been like, you know, I think going below parallel seems to be pretty effective. Um, and it's at least as effective as anything else. And also like, you know, it's a real simple rule because if you just go deep, there's no question of how high you have to cut your squat. I mean, that's all true. He could have just said that, but he wanted to really make a fucking claim, make feel really good about himself. That's a big problem with Dunning Kruger. And you'll notice Denny Kruger's almost never committed uh, as a very low uh, rate of commission by females. But if you ever read Instagram comments, females very rarely commit Denny Kruger because females aren't egotistical pieces of shit like men. They have their own downfalls, of course, uh, but it, they're not as often needing to say shit and be respected for being right. A female will read something and you'll think, what do you think of that? She's going, like, I think it's cool. Like, I'm like, do you want to tell people about it now that you're the expert? And she'll go, I don't, I don't feel like I'm the expert. And, and, and I don't really care if people think I'm smart or whatever. Like, well, I'm fine just reading stuff. Women are often fine just absorbing stuff. It's men, most times, that have to be like, they read one paragraph that's, a, I'm an expert in global economics. Die, hippie scum. Try learning, LOL. They got destroyed, you know, all that like incel shit on YouTube. And that's like people going out of the way. Duh. For, 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 sorry for ranting so much. Dunning Kruger is something you have to go out of your way to do. You can easily not Dunning Kruger yourself by knowing what your limits are and shutting the fuck up. And no amount of learning, learning all it does is expand your limits. That knowing when to shut the fuck up can happen at the beginning of your learning journey, plain and simple. And most people are like that. You know, like a lot of the smarter kids in the classes you went to as high school, they didn't blurt out answers all the time. Like if they didn't know an answer, they would just keep their hand down. Who's the Dunning Kruger kid? It's the kid that guesses at answers that he's not really entirely sure about and he's wrong a lot. And that's something we can just prevent doing by a change of just focus versus necessarily learning stuff. I like that a lot. And just as a sort of a side note for people in the fitness industry, it's a really easy way to differentiate an expert from somebody who's essentially just a bullshit artist is those absolute statements. Like if somebody's making these sweeping statements about, you know, I don't know, carbs are bad or whatever you need to eat more fat to burn more fat, whatever the, the <laughs> nomenclature is. But yeah, if, if folks are making sweeping statements like that, that are just so general, it's insane. That's a way to sort of weed out an expert from somebody who yeah. doesn't know now, what there's a, about. Totally. There's a small chance that they're just unbelievably advanced expert or they are very comfortable making absolute claims. Um, and there is a chance that they're bullshit artists, but it's like 95 to five that they're right. bullshit artists. So will you miss some experts like that? Yeah, but you're going to miss way more people that you should have never been following to begin with. So if you only look at folks that are nuanced, um, and, and here's another uh, sort of benefit to thinking uh, later on in the thinking process. So the really cool thing about learning the fundamentals is there's, there's not a lot of debate about them. And oftentimes they're, they're really lacking an ideological bias. You know, like the, ben the, the basics of ecology are not like, they're not very politically salient things. Like it's just obvious shit that's like, Okay, if organisms have these constraints, this is how their system interacts. Like, it's not, there's nothing political about it. You don't have to mistrust it. You can just be like, no, this is science, whatever. Once you get into more contentious ideas and debates and topics, you start to have to filter out who you're going to listen to more and who you may uh, take with a grain of salt. What you do then is you have, and one of the points you made is like, we're start for an expert detection system. People that are willing to speak more in nuance and admit they don't know things, probably the real experts and people who know everything and everything is an absolute statement, probably not. Once you get five to 10 experts in a field that seem like reasonable, nuanced people, you can consume a lot of their knowledge. Of course, always applying a critical thinking filter, but you know, you can be reasonably certain they're not really trying to just fuck you in the ass and dogmatize you. So once you know them, you can look at who they follow and who they recommend. And some of the people they recommend will also be experts that are more like forthright, more convincing. They sound like bullshit artists, but they actually know their shit. And because they were recommended by five out of 10 of other experts, you can be a little bit more open-minded to them. So, so for example, somebody like Thomas Sowell, who we spoke about earlier, he can be a polarizing figure. But if you look to other people on the left, right, and center of economics, they mostly just have a ton of respect for the guy. So it's kind of like, yeah, he may phrase things pretty harshly, but it's certainly worth a listen versus other people that phrase things really harshly. 
you had talk, you, you'll follow the Twitter feeds of five or, or whatever economics experts. And anytime they talk about that person, they're like, that's just a crazy person. Then yeah, you have an insight as to what's probably like consensus and who the real experts are because you can leverage some experts. Experts are pretty good at realizing when another person is an expert. And that can take you along the line of listening mostly to people who know what they're doing. By the time you get well into that journey, you may know so much yourself that you can start to detect bullshit artists right away just by yourself. You're like, I don't need an expert to vouch for this guy. He's nuts because he's saying things that clash with the fundamentals. And I can tell you where his thinking process is bad. You know, like you and I can spot experts now in diet like super quick. Whereas before when we were like 12 years old, I don't know, but I do want to know what other experts think. I'll, I'll put you this way. If nine out of 10 experts think some other expert potentially or croc, we don't know. If nine out of 10 experts think they're like a completely insane piece of shit, could be that they're an iconoclast and way ahead of their time and the only person speaking truth to power. But that's less likely than they're an insane person who just wants your money. So it's another kind of cool trick there to, to use with thinking. Absolutely, man. Now you mentioned bias. So we're all sort of inherently biased. It's unavoidable. But how do you personally check your bias or essentially test your way of thinking to be sure that you're always moving closer and closer to the truth in your experience? Yeah, there's a lot of ways, but philosophically, it's quite easy. It's difficult to pull off sometimes. One is you simply look at the data and the facts that are not really up for debate, and you try to see what's the most reasonable way to construct these in a system that seems most likely to be true. Um, during that time, you may find that you want them to be agglomerated in such a way as to make you feel happier about yourself or about the state of the world or to fulfill some one of your prerequisite thoughts that you had, but it seems like it's really tough for them to fit that narrative. When you have like a round peg square hole situation, you can get the round peg into the square hole if your bias is high enough, but almost everyone I suspect can feel when they're doing that. Like if you, if you read, let's say you're a fundamentalist religious person and you just don't like gay people, full stop, they're fucking evil, whatever the Bible says they're evil, good enough for me, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I've never read the Bible, like most religious people, LOL. So I just think they're fucking bad. And I run into uh, an article uh, in a peer reviewed journal that says like, oh, like it turns out gay people make the, the same kind of parents, sometimes worse, sometimes better to children than straight people. Now, like I want that to not be true, right? Because I hate gay people. I'm like, fuck, but I can feel that I don't want it to be true. So those things in your head that you, when you feel like, oh, I'd rather this not be this way, that is a literal manifestation of bias itself. You need to understand that and go, okay, I don't want this to be true, but what I want doesn't matter for reality. So I'm just going to go like this. I'm going to look at this article again, and I'm going to do two things for it. I'm going to, uh, straw man's a bad example. I'm going to red team the fuck out of it, which means I'm going to apply as much cynicism and criticism and skepticism to it as I can, see how well it does, try to look for other articles that do, say a different thing try to look for lit reviews, put textbook chapters that say, actually, you know, gay people don't raise children all that well, or it's a huge problem with the way these studies are conducted. And then I'm going to try to steal that. It doesn't matter which one really that you do first. So you say, okay, I'm going to assume gay people are great parents. Let's see how much evidence I can gather for that and how convincing it is and how little of like contrary evidence gets in the way. So once you've caricatured a position uh, and you red team it, which is to say you really, really criticize it, and when you uh, steel man it, which one of those turned out to be better? So imagine red teaming the idea that gay people are good parents. You go in and you try to find contrary articles. And like nine out of the 10 articles you find are like, you know, American religious Orthodox Christians annual like letter to the editor. Like that's where it says gay people are bad and there's no data. And you're like, all right, that's some form of evidence. And then you look at the other side, it's just like reams of textbooks on studies conducted over 25 years with genetics factored out, twin and adoption research, and all this other crazy shit. They're like, yeah, gay people make fine parents. You're like, fuck. <laughs> right? So I don't like gay people and I don't want them to have families. But God damn it. It just seems that they're the balance of the evidence is that it's totally fine to raise families, right? So once you do all that stuff, you can see your bias so clearly 
that you can sort of take it and go, sit right here for a second. Let me look at the facts. And maybe I'll, to my bias's success or happiness, find that it really is true that I was right. My bias was correct. But maybe I won't find that. And then I have to take this bias and go, like, you're not useful anymore. I don't believe that you're real anymore. And now I think this, like, um, you know, I would ideally, when I started exploring the uh, global warming issue, ideally, I would have loved in my ideal heart of hearts that man-made global warming wasn't real. And I approached this issue where I red team the issue and I steel man the issue. And it turns out it was fucking real in, in all likelihood. So I'm like, oh, fuck, God damn it. And then I was like, well, how bad is it? And then I learned that it is marginally bad, but not the end of the world. It's highly unlikely to be the end of the world. Almost certainly doesn't require restructuring of our society completely. And with just a few relatively simple and straightforward policy changes, that's probably the best way forward to a super prosperous and, and clean tomorrow. And I was like, wow, you know, like that's also a difficult position to explain to someone because it's already so nuanced that it doesn't fall on either side. Like either you're supposed to think global warming's fake and fucking pedophile Mark Zuckerberg made it up or whatever the fucking crazy right-wing conservative conspiracy are now. Or you think like, what is that her name? Uh, Greta Thunberg. You think like, we're going to die like, tomorrow that fucking tidal waves are going to come asteroids whatever the hell else golden warning causes the dinosaurs come back to life eat us like it's the worst thing ever it's worse than world war ii we're going to die in 2035 unless we literally go into like socialist ecotopia we're all riding bikes solar panels power everything and mysteriously 6.5 billion of us are gone <laughs> like where the hell is my view well it's it, it's somewhere in there because i took the time to look at uh not just both extremes but look at the balance of the evidence, knew my biases, constantly was reminded of them by what I want to see and went the other way to make sure I steel man the issue. Like, so for example, I'm an ardent anti-communist in my personal life, um, but it, it's not uh, because I just hate everything about communism. I can, I can, I can uh, uh, what's it called? I can steel man communism for you right now. Like communism cares about everyone they're not for people dying in the street of hunger. Like if you're not at some level interested in social redistribution or fucking animal and you have no compassion and a, a strong central government can do a lot of really good stuff that can organize society. People feel really good about sharing and why not have the government do it? I can tell you all sorts of good things about communism, but that's because I have put it into its best possible light. Now, when I put it into a realistic light, or it's worst possible light, oh, really? 100 million people dead, economy is destroyed. I'm like, all right, so on the balance here, I can see some social programs being beneficial in a free economy, but generally communism for the most part kind of sucks. Very different approach than taking the side you want to be biased to and just fucking defending it. Because trying to see something for its best side and knowing that your bias is the other way is tough, but after you do it, you can't help but think, damn, you know, they make some fucking pretty good points. Uh, and a, a huge part of that is not having too big of an ego about attaching yourself to what you think. You know, like I just said, I'm an anti-communist, right? If it was presented to me, unbelievably comprehensive data that demonstrated communism was better than capitalism, bro, oh, I'd be this today, fuck tomorrow. But until and unless that data is presented, I'm not entirely convinced. So again, it's about looking at issues, knowing that your biases are there, pretending you're not biased is a fucking stupid idea really get an internal feel for where your biases are and then go through the same process you would anyway. Uh, steel man the issue on that side, red team the issue on your side, see which one of those holds up better. Because one of them usually is like, man, you know, I tried to red team this. There's just not a lot of evidence against it. I thought there was a ton, but you could, somebody could say like, okay, you hate communism. Yes. Show me your best work as to why it's bad. Dude, I have the entire history of economics journals. It'd be like, read every issue of this journal. <laughs> There's a lot of shit there. But someone can, you know, for another issue, would say like, what's your best argument that vaccines cause autism? You'd be like, well, this one doctor said it once, but there's no <laughs> article about it. And you're like, that's it? Like, I want you to steal man your own issue. And you're like, yeah, um, I just feel like it's true, you know, because people are lying to us. And you're like, do you convince yourself? And you're like, no, <laughs> no, I don't. So, you know, it's one of those, it requires a level of honesty, but recognizing your biases is the big deal. And then just letting them play in their own little field while, while you uh, examine the other sides of the issue. I like that a lot. It's essentially like a, a debate class where they put you on either side and you're essentially forced to argue for, 
for one of the sides of an issue, despite what you actually personally think or feel about that specific totally. issue. Totally. You have to have that debate class in your head. If you want to know more shit, be less likely to be fooled and um, be wrong less and be embarrassed less. There is an alternative. You could have that debate class in real life and get embarrassed to shit on social media or in real life when someone makes you feel fucking stupid. Like you could be at a dinner party and be talking about, man, COVID's myth, the vaccine is bullshit. And there's a mutual friend there that it's an epidemiologist, you and the person you're debating with both respect. And you're like, Frank, Frank, you're an epidemiologist. Tell him. He's like, yeah, COVID's real and the vaccine works. And sorry, wearing masks is marginally better than not. And you're just like, oh man, do I feel fucking stupid? Because this guy's an expert. I don't even know if he starts arguing with me, I don't even know enough terms to argue back. Like, Maybe I should have like thought the shit through in my head. That's probably one of the main reasons uh, that I started the process of being more of a critical thinker. I really don't like to look dumb in public. Like, who does, right? Like, I don't want to be the guy on the YouTube video that just makes a bunch of wrong points, is put into a corner, forced to get irritated and angry. Like, that just sucks. And you can either have that debate, cut the other side as much slack as possible in your head, or you can have that slack cut to you in a social situation when you're not prepared to handle it. Can you imagine debating someone communism and socialism where they're, uh, sorry, the capitalism, communism, and they're pro-capitalist, but they can describe the nuances of dialectic materialism, which is a socialist philosophy, better to you than you can. And what the fuck are you gonna say? Like, well, I'm pro-communist. Oh, can you describe to me dialectic materialism and its evolution through the you know, 1900s to 1930s and be like, uh, no. But yeah, but it's good. Communism is good. Like how? You don't even know how it's good or why. Like, fuck. Like, don't you think you should have looked into your own shit and other people's shit a little bit more deeply? And if you did look into it deeply, you may at some point be like, man, you know, I still love communism. I think it still has a ton of value, but I think it's a nuanced issue. And maybe markets do have power. Maybe we'll go for something like Sweden, where they really tax the fuck out of the rich people on personal taxes, and they have a good social safety net, but they still let markets power everything. Maybe they'll end up somewhere like that. And maybe not. Maybe they'll be the person that used to be this fucking crazy psycho communist, just yell at people, capitalism's a crime, corporate machine, fuck you. And now they have enough doubt based on their own better critical thinking that maybe they're like, yeah, no, communism's still great. And someone's like, hey, do you want to go to a protest? They're like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be on camera for that shit because it could be wrong. Let me keep reading and thinking about it. But like, no, you guys have my support. Fucking the people, shit like that. That's great. But I'm not, no, nah, I'm not a protest kind of guy. So there's that whole situation. I like that. So bias is one thing. And then we sort of have this other thing, sunk cost fallacy. So when somebody, man, it's a tricky one because you might have believed something for you know, 20, 30, 40 years, and then at some point admitting you're wrong. I mean, we do this on a tiny basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. Like you're watching a movie that sucks and you just watch it to the end because you feel like you're too invested to turn it off. You know, yeah, I mean? Sometimes it can get better, but almost never. You're totally right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So how do you, it's, it's a tricky one because it's also tied in with identity and, you know, social groups and things like that, but which, which just complicates the issue that much more. But how, do you, how would you recommend that folks think about sunk cost fallacy, maybe identifying where they are at right now at this point in time and forgetting about the past? Like, how do you go about that? Sure, sure. So uh, two things. One, uh, group identity uh, tied to intellectual ideas is fucking stupid really stupid. As a matter of fact, group identity is itself questionable. For an advanced, not most people have it, but for an advanced thinking person who's really sat with the thoughts for a while and is reasonably intelligent, the entire concept of group identity starts to go out the window. So for example, I'm Jewish, okay? Am I proud to be a Jew? Yeah, some days. Some days I'm not. But at the end of the day, does it really fucking matter in my daily life that I'm Jewish? No. When I smile at someone at the grocery store, does it matter that I'm Jewish? No. If I meet a friend, and I have many friends of all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds and stuff, one of my best friends is a man who is like half Ecuadorian and half Dominican. Am I like, oh, like, you know, if he was a Jew, he'd be better. What the fuck? That's fucking insane ethnocentrism. He's the fucking man. And I don't really give a shit where the fuck he's from or who the fuck he is. And the same thing goes for ideas. Like, you can look at yourself as like, well, I'm a capitalist and 
That's how I identify myself. And other capitalists, they're good people. Really, are they though? Because a lot of capitalists are pieces of shit, money grubbing assholes will sell you down the river the first chance they get. And a lot of communists are just like wide eyed college students that are just beautiful souls that just want to help everyone. They hate suffering and they're fucking great people. I don't hate them. That's insane. So I don't have to have an identity. None of my thoughts or feelings or actions have to marry me to a social group identity. I'm just Mike Isertel. And I can be a socialist today, a capitalist tomorrow, and that's totally fine because I don't need to have my ideas tell me like who I am. Like, what the fuck does that even mean? If you, and this is something postmodernism is actually good for, one of the few things, if you layer away enough of this shit, it turns out identities are all pretty much fucking bullshit. Like, it's, it's especially funny when you get like, everyone's like, you know, I'm proud to be a Jew when I'm around non-Jews. I'm like, yeah, Jew power. What happens when you put me in a fucking synagogue full of other Jews? I'm just like everyone else. And then I have no identity? What the fuck does that mean? Like, well, I'm still a Jew. Like, well, like, what are you now? How, what makes you different than Mordecai over there? I'm like, well, I'm a power lifter Jew. Like, really, that's your deep core values, you're a power lifter? Like, no, if I did jujitsu, I'd be just as good of a person. It turns out none of that shit matters. You just are who you are, and you don't have to marry your ideas to group identity. As soon as you start doing that, that attachment forms, and you can't let go of groups that become, you know, less than a good idea. Like, it might have been fine for many people back in the South, in the rural South in the 18 something, to be like, and this is gonna sound insane, like reasonable people that support the Ku Klux Klan. Like, you know, like I'm a good person and the Ku Klux Klan, like they're good. They're, they're fighting for our communities and stuff. Later you learn they're just total fucking vile pieces of shit that are hanging black people off trees. Could you imagine if you hung on to that identity? Like, no, the Klan's done wrong, but I'm still a fucking Klansman at heart. No, a normal person would be like, fuck that. And this way, do you like the Klan? Like, no, not really. They're kind of nuts, you know? Like, it's great that people can shift away from bad identities. They can shift to good ones. The better thing is just not have identities to begin with. So, so that's a super critical point. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah, I think the tricky thing for some people, they're thinking that, you know, I think a certain thing, my peer group thinks the same thing. And if I change those opinions that they're not going to be a part of their peer. I think that's like the ultimate sort of, you know, fear. It's like sure. excommunication, you know, but. Sure. You got to reevaluate who the fuck your peer group is at that point. Right. And that's one of those things about maybe you can move it a different place. The good thing is about the internet. You can find a peer group for anything. You can find a peer group of people that are just intellectually curious and like to talk about science and stuff. They don't judge you for anything because no one's really all that certain of stuff. So, you know, back in 1920s, if you grew up in like a fucking heartland Christian American town, uh, yeah, I mean, like you, if you were like, <laughs> I'm pro gay, like, you might get killed or, you know, like people, nobody talks to you anymore. Nowadays, either you move to the big city where everyone doesn't give a flying fuck what's going on, uh, or you just associate on the internet with people that, that you find uh, of a similar mindset. So, so that's something that I think is a super powerful um, realization to have about marrying your ideas to identity. Um, and then as far as being able to critically examine your ideas and potentially change them, even though you've invested a lot of thought and have a history, your memory has a history of you believing something. You're like, yeah, like global warming's fake, global warming's fake, global warming's fake from 2010 to 2019. That's what I believed. And now I'm supposed to just like stop thinking that? Well, it's actually a pretty easy problem. What is your best estimate now? Is global warming fake? And you're like, okay, honestly, if I don't tell anyone, don't tell my friends, 5%. It's 95% probably that it is real. Like, I got you, I got you. So there's a very decent chance you, every day that you are anti-global warming, you're making a fundamental mistake. Like, yeah, almost certainly. I got you, okay. How much longer would you like to pay that cost for? Like, if your house is flooded and you can pull a plug that unfloods it, right? How high do the waters need to get for you to pull the plug? Most normal people be like, well, as soon as I find out it's flooded, I don't care if there's a foot of water, or five, I pull the plug right away and get the fucking water out so I can fucking clean my house. So you may have had a flooding house of incorrect beliefs for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And the question really is, when do I pull the plug on that? And the answer is as soon as you reasonably can honestly in your deepest insights tell yourself, okay, that, that idea is no longer correct. Uh, I had a recent situation like that where um, I used to think the P ratio was super important. 
uh, like partitioning ratio of how much muscle versus fat you gain, going from roughly 10% to 20% fat. I thought the curve was was pretty blunted that like when you get closer to 20% fat, building muscles much harder and you gain fat much more easily. Uh, new research has been brought to light by the Stronger by Science team, Greg Knuckles, and particularly Eric Trexler, Trexler who I just had a debate on uh, Steve Hall's channel about uh, the P ratio. The view is much more nuanced that it's much more likely that between 10 and 20%, and this is a charitable view, that it probably just doesn't matter and you can gain just as much muscle versus fat ratio if you're anywhere between 10 and 20%. Uh, if you're not taking performance enhancing drugs, they make things a little different. But for most people, it's just 10 to 20% doesn't really matter much. Um, I'm on record saying the P ratio matters. Now I'm on record as of Steve Hall's podcast that's coming out in a week and a half saying that, yeah, between 20, 10 and 20% is probably not a big deal at all. And it's by no means clear which one is the advantage. Do you gain more muscle from 10 to 15% or more from 15 to 20? I wouldn't even bet any money on that at this point. That's a change in my views. Does, is that embarrassing? No, like, well, I, I don't understand why it would be embarrassing. Based on the available evidence and reasoning I had, I thought the P ratio was valuable and I thought it looked a certain way. Now, based on the available evidence and reasoning that I have, which is more because the research has been significantly updated, uh, I think something different. Always and everywhere, the only thing I can be depended on for is to have a position that reflects my best assessment of the research and the logic at the time. And as that changes, so will my opinions. Cannot depend on me for consistent opinions because consistency is a neat thing to have in many parts of your life, but in intellect, it is not a neat thing to have. You want accuracy. Accuracy is better than consistency. So putting it to people like this, I can, I can meme this for you much, much uh, faster. All that bullshit I just set aside, you just ask someone who's demonstrating the sunk cost fallacy. So for how much longer do you want to be wrong? And they say, uh, ideally never. Like, right, can't go back in time. You've been wrong for five years. Would you want to take it to 10? They're like, no, fuck that. Sweet. Well, just change your opinion now. <laughs> and I will tell you this. There's temptation to take an ego hit and be like, man, people don't like shifty people. They don't like people to change their opinions. People are gonna think less of me intellectually. But if I know a person in my intellectual life that changed their opinion pretty radically based on the balance of the evidence, my respect for their intellect and their value goes up fucking like crazy. Huge. That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate scientist. That's the ultimate logical thinker, you know, like, Imagine dealing with a super AI, unreal alien robot that was like, you know, I don't know the English language. You give him a dictionary and he goes, I now know the English language. You know, like, oh my God, he's updated his views so fast. If he came in with some incorrect assumptions about the earth, he's like, the core is made of uranium. You're like, actually, it's not. Check this book out on geology. He goes, the core is not made of uranium. It is made of blah, 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 blah. And you're like, this guy's the fucking man. It's the smartest thing that's ever been. He'd be like, nah, man, he should have stuck to his values. God damn it. The <laughs> core is made of uranium. You get science core is made of uranium. Like, I wouldn't respect if the alien was like, no, I don't need your human dictionaries. They are wrong. He'd be like, this alien's a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, but if he can update his views quickly with no ego, that's a truly dangerous thing. You know, lives, it's going to be all aliens pretty soon after that, right? So it's people think that changing their views based on the evidence is a, is a form of like, um, letting other people down, letting themselves down, that they don't demonstrate enough of a spine, enough consistency. Consistency is a good idea when it's applied to valuable things that are true. Consistently push the barrel up the hill because the barrel has to go to the top of the hill. Don't quit because you'll be a fucking pussy. You just quit because of weakness. But if someone tells you, hey, that's the wrong hill, you need to push it up the other hill. You're like, nope, God damn it. I started pushing it up this hill and I'm going to finish. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're nuts. So anytime your opinions vastly contradict what you probably in your own head think to be true, but you're still perseverating on them, that probably means you're nuts and you don't want to be nuts. So change your opinions. And if someone says, oh man, you really flip-flopped on that issue because incels like to do that, right? Like on Instagram and YouTube, like, oh, Dr. Mike, I thought you thought this. I'm like, yes, now I think this. And they're like, oh, huh. there's no punchline. There's no punchline after that. They could say hypothetically, well, I used to trust you, but I don't know what to trust anymore. My response would be like, you shouldn't trust me. You should view me as giving you my best assessment of the evidence as it is. I never said I was infallible. I never said I was always right. Uh, I could be wrong. And I always say I could be wrong. And they're like, God damn it. So a lot of times people want ultimate truth. That's not attainable. Real truth uh, is tough to get at. And we sometimes make mistakes. And whenever we finally make a mistake, it's for 
your own good to switch back to what's most likely to be correct. And you're not going to be embarrassed by anybody because the people that will make fun of you for flip-flopping, everyone who's smart and who knows shit is going to look at them and be like, dude, that guy's fucking retarded. You did a good thing by changing your opinion. Like they, one of the greatest acts in this regard, I believe occurred when the preeminent scientist who espoused an alternative view to the plate tectonic theory of crust movement, I think he was at the very end of his career and he wrote a piece where he was like, I was wrong. And my entire career pretty much was uh, inconclusive and plate tectonics won. Like it's Holy real. Shit. I am now finishing my career believing in plate tectonics. That guy's a fucking God. I could name my kids after that guy. That guy, like, he's not a mortal person. Like, if you stood next to him at the grocery store, you'd be like, I can't, I can't believe this guy's in front of me. That's a fucking ascended being. Like, if some guy was like, no, play Ted Towns is bullshit, and then he died, and everyone knew he was, died wrong. Like, is that guy cooler? Is he like, yeah, like, he really stuck to his shit? What the fuck? Fuck that guy. That's a really great point around changing your opinion. Like, it, it is a sign that you're doing your homework. You're obviously progressing, right? And it's also just endearing because it's like, hey, I made a mistake. Like now I think this, it, it's not like totally. I did it with malintent. <laughs> totally, totally. Now, if you make fun of people with other opinions and then you hold theirs later, it can look a little irksome. And it's just don't be a fucking dick all the time. And then you have no, no problems, right? Uh, and you really are, it's, it's a sign of like a really high degree of, of maturity when you can alter your views, I will say the one sort of stick in the spokes for that is Dunning-Kruger. Dunning-Kruger exhibition of it, like we talked about earlier, it's usually not a factor of expertise, but a factor of how much you're willing to talk about it you don't know about. If you jump on a bunch of stuff and just start wrapping off at the mouth about it, this is the greatest thing ever. This is for sure the truth. You may find yourself in a position of having to change your view every three months because you really stick to something intensely, even though you're not quite sure it's true. And then in three months, it's like, well, that's not true. And you're like, I was wrong, guys. I was wrong. Can you imagine being a fitness influencer on Instagram and you know, having a lot of followers and being like, sugar is evil. And then three months later, you're like, guys, sugar's not evil. I was wrong. Fat, fat's evil. And then three <laughs> months later, you're like, guys, fat's not evil. If enough people watch you flip-flop like this, they're like, dude, I don't even know why the fuck I follow this person. This person's a crazy person. Anytime they latch onto something, I just wouldn't expect it to last because it never does. Then your problem isn't, the core of your problem isn't that you flip-flop. The core of your problem is you attach yourself to shit that just by no means should be attached to at all or even, even tentatively. You know, say like, hey, this recent study came out about sugar being bad. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, we have to look at the balance of the evidence. I await more research before I make a firm opinion. That's how an expert answers that shit. But if you're like, yeah, you see that study? Sugar's killing us all. That's your real problem. Not the fact that you'll have to flip-flop in three months when a, a review comes out of that study and said these guys made up their data. Funny enough, that actually happens in real life. The um, Ramazzini Foundation in Italy uh, put out a series of studies on aspartame in rats. And uh, the rats that ate aspartame versus real sugar got like cancer and shit, like way higher rates and their bodies degraded. And they were like, see, it turned out when, <laughs> so the reviewers requested raw data like, okay, where's the actual data you collected? Not the statistics, not the summary, the actual data. They were like, yeah, we can't give you that. Like, what? Like, you do have the raw data, right? And they were like, no response, no comment. And then it turned out they basically faked the studies and the studies they didn't fake, the control group rats uh, that didn't get aspartame were younger by a huge factor than the aspartame rats who were like way older. Like, of course, fucking old rats get cancer. So it, it turns out the Ramazzini studies were all just straight bullshit. And almost all the other studies in aspartame, it's like it's totally safe. Rats can eat like a, the amount of aspartame that would make another rat of its size the same day and be fine. Crazy shit like that. But a lot of people attach themselves to Ramazzini studies and they're like, see, aspartame is poison. And the problem was that they went on a limb for, you know, how many studies in aspartame? There's hundreds of studies in aspartame. They have that, this is actually really summarizes the conversation so far. They had that initial bias towards being like, ah, artificial is bad. They went with it. They really quickly attached themselves to an identity of I'm against artificial sweeteners. They didn't recognize their bias well enough. They really quickly attached to something that was very tenuous to begin with. They didn't see the balance of the evidence. And then they are forced to flip-flop when someone points out like, dude, the Ramazzini studies are literally fucking hoax. And they're like, oh shit, I feel stupid. You should have felt stupid a long time ago. <laughs> but to the uh, extent that, you know, the sunk cost fallacy, at least you feel stupid now. Maybe you can learn a lesson from this and not go insane. I will say though, um, just on a comedic note and maybe a little bit of a sad one, I, maybe it's not sad. 
I have been somehow associated with the fitness industry and the health industry for like, I've been aware of stuff in it for maybe 15 years at least. And for 20 years, I've been aware of what people around me were eating and what they thought about food and health and fitness. Marcus, I like have legit seen people who fell for every single fad, every single one that has existed from the year 2000 to 2020. Like, that's not a joke. Like I knew people who were in the year 2000 were like olive oil, everything. It's a miracle cure. Three years later, avocados. Five years after that, they were doing whole eggs, bacon, no carbs because saturated fats are amazing. Carbs are the devil. Then they did fucking some kind of fasting, then keto. Then uh, what is that shit? The, um, it's a fucking extract or a juice, uh, apple cider vinegar. They were like, that shit is the fucking bomb. It's going to cure you of everything. And it's like they never really learned that they're falling for fads. They're just looking for the next fad. That shit is kind of sad. You know what I mean? I'm sure you know some people in your own life that just can't wait to fall for the next fad. Absolutely, man. And I think that comes back to what we talked about initially. And it's, you know, educating yourself on the basics. Like, how does this stuff work? What are the fundamentals? Because then it just sort of makes it easier to like disregard uh, the apple cider vinegar, the supplement this, or the fat burner that. Um, And you talked about, the influencer who's constantly flip-flopping again, same deal. If they just went back to the basics, understood how this shit works, they're not going to be flip-flopping on a weekly basis and they can come across as, I guess, consistency in this case would be a good thing because you're never too, too wrong. Like you might get some small things wrong here and there, but you're not like way off on everything. Totally. If you come at it from a perspective of a baseline understanding of knowledge, you probably wouldn't make any gigantic mistakes. And that's nice for your ego. Uh, it's better for just your function as a person and your advocacy for issues in general, because then you, you can help progress other people around you better. You know, if you knew foundational elements of basic dieting and you knew that adherence is the most important thing in that whole situation, you could have advocated just marginally eating slightly higher quality foods, not overeating, and choosing a diet that really you can adhere to for the last 50 years. And then the people that were around you were like, dude, I love it that you've been preaching these principles because I didn't have to fuck up. It's, it's funny because like most of my best friends are remotely involved in the fitness industry and a ton of them don't fall for fitness fads because they know who I am We've been bullshit before for a long time. And they just know that when something is looks revolutionary, it probably isn't. They know how to, they know the basics just from talking to me and they just know that fads are fads and they just don't make a ton of mistakes. Like that's a great bit of influence to have on someone to like not fall for bullshit. But if you're a person who falls for a lot of bullshit yourself, a lot of your friend group, if you're the authority on health, they're going to be falling for bullshit with you. I mean, that's even more fucked up than you fucking yourself in the ass. You know, like think about like you had all your family on Atkins and then you had all your family on keto and then you had all your family on vegan. Like that exists in the world. And that's the kind of thing like I would be okay, you know, falling asleep at night, taking tally of what kind of piece of shit human being I am. I'd be okay with my own mistakes. But if I let a lot of other people down wasteful paths, I'd feel pretty fucking bad about that. So at least critical thinking can make you give other people decent advice and knowing the fundamentals so that you don't have to lead a bunch of other people astray, you know? And then there's like entire websites like Mercola or whatever, if you ever have time to Google something. Like you go on Mercola and you're like, this is an entire website of lies. <laughs> and it, it's one of the highest hit websites in all of like trafficked Google. So it's, it's a thing. I have come across Mercola and it's wildly popular. It's insane. It's crazy. Cause like if you Google artificial sweeteners, it's like in the top three links. Mm. And you click on it, you just don't know anything. You click on it and you're like, oh my God, our official sweeteners are killing us all. Like it's this huge sham. And and then even then some intellectual training, like what we've been talking about can come in handy. You know, you said like people that are very certain, positive about things can be probably considered non-experts and maybe just charlatans. There's a, there's a couple of other elements to detecting charlatanism in, in one of them is people who front uh, really, really gigantic conspiracies tend to be charlatans and people who make very bombastic claims that just seems like a little bit less likely to be true. It's like, you know, the Mercola website will be like, artificial sweeteners are killing us. They cause cancer, diabetes, blah, there's a whole list, right? And like, you just have to think like a little bit. like Argh. So like the FDA approves these things. And like you Google artificial sweeteners, you actually go to Wikipedia and you're like, 
Aspartame has been approved by the FDA equivalents of over 90 countries independently. Now, like, um, what's the chance that there's a conspiracy that's that vast, you know, like tiny? And can you imagine like you're the president of Coca-Cola, right? And you fucking, fucking for sure know aspartame kills everyone. Like you could be like, should we stop putting out aspartame drinks? And some, some guys like nonsense, it'll, it'll, our stock will plummet and be like, yeah, but like what happens to our stock when like in 10 years, people figure out that we have this huge conspiracy. Like, first of all, we're all going to go to jail and I want to be on my sailboat by then. They don't have sailboats in jail as far as I know. And also like, even if I'm not retired, I just want to make more money. This will take Coca-Cola completely. Like they may even restructure the company and convict us of fucking war crimes or some shit. Do you guys want to do that? If people always think corporations are up to no good, but they're like, shh. Like most of the times when corporations find out their products are going to hurt someone, 99% of the time, we only ever hear about the exceptions. 99% of the time they're like, oh my fuck, like let's stop doing this immediately and choose something safer. Do you think Coca-Cola really wants to sell you aspartame? No, they can fly fuck what they sell you. If you say, if you demonstrate your market demand, you're willing to buy water that has shit in it, Coca-Cola will absolutely sell it to you as long as the FDA approves of it. They don't give a shit. They want to know what you want and they're not going to fucking hurt their own bottom line by giving you shit that kills you. They would rather not do that. They would just give you regular sugar because everyone knows regular sugar is not that great. But nobody gives a shit. They drink it anyway. It's just like Mercola's like there's this diabolical plan to poison us all. And you're like, maybe, but like, maybe not. And then you're like, wait a minute. Like, how does Mercola make their money? Like, oh yeah, and website traffic ads and their bullshit supplements. Like, hmm. I wonder who's lying here. This is funny. They'll simultaneously be like, corporations are evil. They're like, aren't you guys a corporation? They're like, <laughs> exactly. nonsense. <laughs> We're the truth. So Yeah, the, the corporations one always gets me because it's like, even if they are all pieces of shit, which is just not the case, they're about making money. And at the end of the day, if you die from aspartame intake, they can't make any more money. So anyways, when, when um, you were looking at the people that have fallen for those same trends just year after year for 15 years. What was that through line? Like, what do you think is that common thread between those individuals? They just want to believe there's a quick fix. Like what is it about that person that just has them over and over fall for that same thing? Two things, a lack of interest in learning the basics, which they consider boring and uh, an irrational expectation of and actually, I was I was on an uh, interview for another project just recently, just before this podcast, and I sort of described this idea. People have this um, there's a logical fallacy it's called the Nirvana fallacy, but it's not specific enough. Um, they have this idea that solutions um, can be and are usually exist that are minimal input radically simple and beautifully serendipitous that like we're all like this and if you just tilt this way it locks in place and everything's solved so they're they're looking for things like you know okay sugar if i just stop eating sugar that one thing my health improves my life improves my thinking improves cravings are gone it's a one-stop shop they have this belief that everything will click magically into place if they just figure out the core the what's wrong with the system. And I think maybe that that sort of mechanism uh, evolved with specifically a lot of females fall for this. Females are actually more attuned to uh, impurities and poisons, probably because their own physiology is more affected by them for pregnancy. And if they're carrying a child for sure, and if they're nursing a child for sure, they have to be more sensitive to poisons. Uh, a lot of people are really intent from an evolutionary perspective subconsciously to detect the what's wrong. And it's just the one thing you have to remove. It's like, you see this little pool we were drinking water from, that's what's causing people to be sick. We gotta switch to the other side of the river. And when you do that, there's no more sickness. Like, fuck, that was it. That was always it. It wasn't some comprehensive bullshit, science, foundationals. It was this one fix. And that is a lot of that, that instinct uh, for that one quick fix is something people take and they want it because look, look, if it's true, holy shit, all you got to do is find that one thing and it solves all your fucking problems. Um, interestingly, technology and capitalism have not made this better. They've made it worse, allowed it to become worse. Why? Because capitalism and technology married together give you quick fixes. Like your cell phone is the answer to 50 of your problems, including 10 you didn't know you have. It, it works every time. It's, it's a fucking miracle. It's fucking magic. So people get used to it and be like, well, yeah. Cell phone's magic. It does everything I want. Why can't I diet? <laughs> like, well, 
in 10 or 15 or 20 years, pharma will put out a pill that keeps you at whatever weight you want and keeps you incredibly lean and super healthy. They will do that. I have no question that they will. Um, that's just not here yet, bro. <laughs> and you can pretend and want it to be here. They want that fix. So they don't want to invest the time to foundational stuff. And they want that easy, quick, sort of that synchronicity, that click and like, oh, it's all fixed. Um, you know, that's, that's not even how you clean your house. I mean, can you imagine like you pick up one speck of dust and you look and all the others are gone. You're like, I did it. It was the right speck. It was the central fucking quantum speck that was entangled. What the fuck does that mean? Like you got a fucking vacuum behind all the corners. It sucks. But like, that's how you fucking clean the house. And there's like, you can buy a special mop that helps a little bit. You can schedule your house cleaning once a week. So it never gets out of hand. People know this from their daily lives, but in, in exercise and in diet and in relations to body fat and fitness, they're still looking for that one fucking magic trick. Is anything I've seen in 20 years, those are the people that float in and consistently fuck themselves over. I have, I have family like that. They'll be like, hey, what do you think of this new thing? I'm like, for the 18th time, I think nothing of new things until they are commonly accepted old things. Like <laughs> one out of 20 times, that new thing is real and it works and it's awesome. But like, that's one out of 20 times. That means they fail 19 times and succeed the 20th. Because, you know, at some point, their new thing could be like watching a Dr. Mike talk on Ted and then buying the healthy eating book or Renaissance. And they're like, I discovered it. This is it. And I'm like, yeah, it actually is it. Like, sweet. You finally stumbled on a fad that fucking worked. Uh, but you know, you're wrong a lot and maybe they'll stumble away from it to something else. And that's the, that's probably the most heartbreaking thing that I've ever seen is people that used to do like principled right shit, but they never knew why it worked. They never understood the principles. Someone was like, Hey, try RP. And they're like, great. And then they switch to something else. Like I'm doing keto now. And I'm like, fuck, you learned nothing. You didn't learn anything. And, and some people just don't. Yeah. Fair enough, man. I know you got to go. So where can folks learn more about you, maybe the hypertrophy book, all that good stuff, social handles, tell them where to find you. Social stuff, YouTube, Renaissance Periodization YouTube, just type in Isratel on YouTube uh, and Isratel Mike Strength and you'll get our channel because Renaissance is impossible to spell. Um, if somebody just gave me a piece of paper, like a paper and a pen and like spell your company's name and be like, oh shit, do I get <laughs> autocorrect on this thing? They're like, no, I'm like, oh, I have no idea. It doesn't start with an R. Uh, but RP, D-R-M-I-K-E on Instagram, RP Dr. Mike, RP Strength on Instagram uh, for all that valuable shit. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's all the plugin I think I can do. Awesome, man. I'll link all that in the show notes and thanks for doing this. Dude, thank you so much for having me on.